Thus have I heard on one occasion a blessed one was living in the Sakian country in Kapvilavatu in Negrodas Park. Kapvilavatu is where the Bodhisattva grew up. And it was pretty fancy. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One, dressed, taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Kapvilavatu for alms. When he'd wandered for alms in Kapvilavatu and had returned from his alms round, after his meal, he went to the great wood for the day's abiding. Entering the great wood, he sat down at the root of a bulva sapling for the day's abiding. Dandapani, he was one of the minor kings of the area that supported the Brahmins. He didn't like what the Buddha was teaching at all. <coughs> Dandapani, the Sakyan, while walking and wandering for exercise, also went to it to the great wood and when he entered the great wood he went to the Bulva sapling where the Blessed One was and exchanged greetings to him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished he stood at one side. He didn't pay respect to the Buddha at all and he had his head higher than the Buddha so he, he considered himself better than the Buddha. <coughs> Then he stood at one side, leaning on his stick, and asked the Blessed One, What does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? Friend, I assert and proclaim my teaching in such a way that one does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, in such a way that perceptions no more underlie the brahmin who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being, <clears throat> when this was said, Dandapani the Sakyan shook his head, wagged his tongue, and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered with three lines. Then he departed, leaning on his stick. When it was evening, it's hot in here. When it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to Negrota's park, where he sat down on a seat made ready for him and told the monks what had taken place. Then a certain monk asked the Blessed One, But Venerable Sir, how does the Blessed One assert and proclaim his teaching in such a way that he does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas. In this generation, with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people. <coughs> now, the Buddha already said this. This happened to me. I don't know why, but a teacher would ask me the question and give me the answer. And all I did was repeat exactly what he said, and oh, everybody liked that. I would say, all right, that's good. It didn't make sense to me. I, it was more like a game. But what can I do? And venerable sir, how is it that perceptions no more underlie the blessed one, that Brahman, who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, shorn of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. Monk, <clears throat> as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. 
What is mental proliferation? Thinking about, analyzing, figuring out, not paying attention to the six R's, right? So that's what mental proliferation is, and you're going to hear that quite often. If nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, the end of the underlying tendency to aversion, the end of the underlying tendency to craving, the end of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words and false speech. Here these evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. Now what unwholesome states is he really talking about? He's talking about craving. That makes everything unwholesome. That's the cause of all of our suffering. And that's why I stress the six R's so much, because that's the way you overcome it. That's the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And not making a big deal out of stuff when it comes up. Oh, I had this wonderful feeling, so? that'll last for a little while, disappear. Then you're gonna get a painful feeling. And then you go, oh, I hate that. I don't want that one around. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Always after he gave a short discourse, he waited for people to ask him questions about it. If they didn't ask, he said, oh, they know what I'm talking about, I'm out of here. But you'll see, then soon after the Blessed One had gone, the monks considered, now friends, the Blessed One had risen from his seat and gone to his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, who will expound this in detail? Then they considered the venerable Mahakachana was praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He's capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and ask him the meaning of this. Now you're going to see how he gets slapped. They get slapped around a bit. Then the monks went to the venerable Mahakachana, exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down at one side and told him all that had taken place, adding, let the venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The venerable Mahakachana replied, friends, it is though a man seeking heart would needing heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood. After he passed over the root and the trunk. So it is with you, venerable sirs, that you think I should be asked about the meaning of this after you pass the Blessed One by. 
when you were face to face with the teacher, knowing this the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is a Dhamma, he is the Holy One, he is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. So anytime I ask if you have any questions, guess what? You're gonna wind up stupid. <laughs> as I told you, so you should have, as, as he told you, so you should have remembered it. Surely, friend, Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows, seeing he sees, he is vision, he is knowledge, he is the Dhamma. He is the Holy One, the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dhamma, the Tathagata. That was the time that we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told us, we should have remembered it. Yet the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. Anytime you hear wiser wisdom is talking about the understanding of dependent origination. The Venerable Mahakachana is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expounding the, de without expounding the detailed meaning. Let the Venerable Mahakachana expound it without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the monks replied, the venerable Maha Kachana said this. Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary and brief without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, monks as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to. This is the end of the underlying tendency to lust. The end of the underlying tendency to aversion. The end of the underlying tendency to craving. The end of the underlying tendency to views. That's opinions and ideas, too, which is basically philosophy. And what is philosophy? It's a whole lot of words stuck together without any action behind it. So that's not what I'm teaching you. I'm not teaching you a philosophy at all. I'm teaching you how to teach yourself. So, <clears throat> the end of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. <clears throat> I understand the detailed meaning of it to be as follows. Dependent on the I and forms, I consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is eye contact. With eye contact as condition, there is eye feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. 
what one perceives that one craves. What one craves that one thinks about. What one thinks about that one mentally proliferates. Now, mental proliferation, I have another definition for that and I call that your habitual emotional tendencies. Okay? Every time you get caught up in craving and clinging, then you naturally start thinking about things and get emotional with them. And you cause yourself huge amounts of suffering. So, you want to be able to catch the craving as soon as it arises. That subtle tightness in your head, you want to be able to let that go. If craving, is, you let go of it, then there's no uh, clinging. And when there's no clinging, there's no habitual tendency. When there's no habitual tendency, there's no birth of actions. When there's no birth, then there's no sorrow, lamentation, lust, greed, and, oh, despair. lust and despair. That's, I, I couldn't pull it out. Isn't that something? With what has one has mentally proliferated as the source, Perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past, future, and present forms cognizable through the eye. Can you talk about that sentence a little more? Is it saying, I guess my question is, is it saying that there's some sort of contact, feeling, perception, craving, thinking, and then and then, and then thinking. yes. And then, so you're, you're that much more removed from that original point of contact. Right. And you know, cause you're yourself that much more right. sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Over the thinking of the things that were Yeah, it's yeah. your opinions, your ideas that you hold dearly. You think this is the way it's got to be because that's what I figured out. And that's not right. We're so confused and because of the craving and taking that personal belief that I am these thoughts, I am these opinions and ideas, that you're willing to fight anybody for it. Yourself. And can yourself, yeah. So, okay. yeah. Well, just to follow up on that, so I think the last thing you remember was proliferation to the past, present, and future. So anytime we're thinking about the past or the future, that would be proliferation? Of course. What else would it be? And a lot of what you think about in the present because you're going from your past experience. But when you let go of the craving, that doesn't happen. <clears throat> That's why I say your mind is pure when you let go of the craving. There can still be thoughts without craving. No. no. It won't even come up. So, without so there's a little bit of thinking, there's a little bit of craving. Well. Yeah. But there are times, especially when you get into the quiet mind, that you can have an observation thought that doesn't have any craving in it. It's just an observation. My mind is really quiet right now. Very peaceful, very calm. And then you continue on. Sometimes you need a little bit of verbalization 
just to have it set in your mind. But not very often. Okay. Here comes the question. <laughs> so what about the type of thoughts, say you're in a conversation with somebody, that, like they ask you for direction somewhere? Um, are those thoughts So what about it? Well, you're still going to live. You still have the five aggregates. But you won't have so much craving. You're not going to have such strong opinions about things. Okay? I mean, the Buddha, he lived for 45 years with a pure mind. No craving in it at all. But he still talked about things. He still answered questions. And he paid attention to his intuition. He was coming straight from his intuition. And you'll get a glimpse of how to do that on this retreat. Okay? Yeah. In your experience of, of meditation, when did um, that set in for you, the idea of the craving? Well, I've always been interested in the craving, but I didn't know the definitions of it until I came up with them. And that was... Oh, uh, about 1993, however many years ago that is. That's when I, I first started recognizing for myself, and that's when I went back out to the forest to confirm. It was a real interesting time. In the morning, I would read the suttas from noon until 11 or 12 o'clock at night, I would sit. And I was just happy as a clam. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't be any happier. And there was nobody to talk to. It was so nice and quiet. I talked to the snake every now and then, but that's nothing. But I'd go out in the morning, I'd go out for alms around and eat once a day. And the rest of the time was study and pra practice. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises with the meeting of the three. There is ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there is ear feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one is mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to past, future, and present sounds cognizable through the ear. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is nose contact. With nose contact as condition, there is nose feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. Now you hear me say a lot of time that your thinking mind is nonsense. And I literally mean that to be two words. Non-sense. Because most of the stuff you think about is trash. <laughs> uh, one, uh, Keshri Damananda used to call it rubbish. But it's the same, same. 
with what one has mentally proliferated as the source. That's all your opinions and ideas. That's what you get worked up about. Perceptions and notions born of mental, mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past, future, and present odors cognizable through the nose. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is tongue contact. With tongue contact as condition, there is tongue feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man or beset a person with respect to past, future and present. Taste cognizable through the nose. Dependent <clears throat> on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is body contact. With body contact as condition, there is body feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves what one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past, future and present tangibles cognizable through the body. Dependent on mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. With the meeting of the three, there is mind contact. With mind contact as condition, there is mind feeling. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one craves. What one craves, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one is mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to past, future and present. Mind objects <coughs> through mind. Look in the Satipatthana Sutta. Dependent on, oops, I went, didn't go far enough. When there is the eye of form and eye consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of eye contact. When there is the manifestation of eye contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of eye feeling. When there is the manifestation of eye feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. 
when there is the ear a sound and ear consciousness it is possible to point out the manifestation of ear contact when there is the manifestation of ear contact it is possible to point out the manifestation of ear feeling when there is a manifestation of ear feeling it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is the nose and odor and nose consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose contact. When there is a manifestation of nose contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of nose feeling. When there is a manifestation of nose feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. <clears throat> when there is a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is the tongue of flavor and tongue consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of tongue contact. When there is a manifestation of tongue contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of tongue feeling. When there is the manifestation of tongue feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is the body, a tangible and body consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of body contact. When there is a manifestation of body contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of body feeling. When there is a manifestation of body feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. <clears throat> when there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is the manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When, it is, when there is a manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is mind, mind object, and mind consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of mind contact. When there is a manifestation of mind contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of mind feeling. When there is a manifestation of mind feeling, it is possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is a manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there is a manifestation of craving, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. 
when there's the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. Now, this next section is talking about being in the Arupa Jhanas, where you have no more eye, no more ear, where you're in a mental realm. When there's no I, no form, and no I consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of I contact. Why? Because it's not there. Because your mind is quiet. Okay, this is the importance of getting into the quiet mind. Now, some of you don't understand what I'm saying right now, but you will by the end of the retreat, I promise. You'll be able to experience it on your own. So, <clears throat> when there's no manifestation of eye contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of eye feeling. When there's no manifestation of eye feeling, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of craving. That's when you have a quiet mind. That's when your mind is most pure, when there's no disturbance at all. It's just quiet. And there's a lot of relief on that. So when there's no manifestation of craving, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's no manifestation of thinking, it is impossible uh, to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there's no nose, no odor, and no eye consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of nose contact. When there's no manifestation of nose contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of nose feeling. When there's no manifestation of nose feeling, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of nose craving. When there's no manifestation of nose craving, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of think, uh, no, or just thinking. When there's no manifestation of thinking, it's impossible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. Now, the reason that I'm teaching you this way is because this stuff is real. But don't believe me, please. See for yourself. And you'll see that there's personality development when you, when you practice this. And you'll be more happy all the time. You'll be more content and having more and more balance in your mind. And you're going to start getting into the finest degree of equanimity. That's disenchantment. In Asia, food is really, really important. I mean, you talk about certain foods that people like and they start drooling a little bit. But when you get to disenchantment, you'll see that favorite food, you know it was your favorite food, and you'll eat it, but you don't get into the craving and, and the uh, over-attachments to the food. You recognize that this is food, I need to eat food to continue on, 
And yeah, and it tastes good. That's okay. But so what? This is just to keep give energy to my body, so I will continue. So it's real interesting that you uh, understand this. And as your perception of how you see the world changes, so does your personality. You become more, more calm, more at ease, uh, not so excitable. And other people will notice that. Now, a lot of people want to be a teacher. Being a teacher is not an easy task because you have to be the example, okay? Just like your little kid, you learn from watching your parents. If your parents argued and fought all the time, you grow up thinking that's the way life is supposed to be. But when you see somebody that's really peaceful and calm, you want, I, I want some of that. That's, that's good stuff. I was at a museum in uh, Kuala Lumpur. It was real interesting what I was looking at. And I was just standing there looking and, and uh, appreciating the, the art of things and that sort of thing. And then I got ready to move and there was people around me. And when I started moving, they thought I was a mannequin. And when I started moving, it made them scared. Oh, jeez. They thought they just put me in the middle just <laughs> to draw other people. It was interesting. Anyway, when there's no tongue, no taste, and no tongue consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of tongue contact. It just won't arise. When there's no manifestation of tongue contact, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of tongue feeling. When there's no manifestation of tongue feeling, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of craving. When there's no manifestation of craving, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. If there's no manifestation of thinking, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of besetment by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. Friends, when the Buddha rose from his seat and went into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning, that is, monks, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a man, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, or push away, I want to put that in. Because a lot of times they talk about craving only as greedy mind. But it's also aversion mind. And that's why I say that's what craving is. It's the I like it, I don't like it. It's the greedy mind and it's the aversion mind. But it's the same thing, just different sides. So you have to treat them both in the same way. Especially when you start having some pains come up in your body. It's okay for those pains to be there. It has to be okay. You don't need to fight with the truth. If you do, you can look forward to that pain coming back and getting bigger. <laughs> it's up to you. 
You are your own teacher. <clears throat> or hold to this is the end of the underlying tendency to lust, the underlying tendency to aversion, the end of the underlying tendency to craving, the end of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here these evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of this summary to be thus. Now, friends, if you wish, go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this. As the Blessed One explains it to you, so you should remember it. Then the monks, having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Mahakachana's words, rose from their seats and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he had left, adding, Then, venerable sir, we went to the venerable Mahakachana and asked him about the meaning. The Venerable Mahakachana expounded the meaning of this with these terms, statements, and phrases. Mahakachana is wise, monks. Mahakachana has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the same way that Mahakachana has explained it. Such is the meaning of this, and so you should remember it. When this was said, Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, just as if a man exhausted by hunger and weakness came upon a honey ball, wherever he would taste, it would be, he would find a sweet, delectable flavor. So too, venerable sir, any able-bodied monk, whoever he might, however he might scrutinize with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma, would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable sir, what is the name of the discourse on the Dhamma? As to that, Ananda, you may remember it as this discourse on the Dhamma as the honey ball discourse. That's what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now we have books over here, and one of them is called Concept and Reality. Uh, I, I told some of my students, and they were into reading for enjoyment, not for education. And they started reading, and they said, oh, this is dry. And when I got a hold of that, another book gave it to me. He said, this book is great. You got you to gotta read it. I couldn't put it down. I mean, I was so fascinated with Papancha which means a concept, the conceptual world. It's caught up in proliferation, as it were. And I've read it three or four times. That's how good it is. But I had the opportunity to meet him. And it's kind of a funny story because I've, I've known about uh, the concept and reality, that book, since 
um, the mid 90s and I really liked it and, and I, I gave it away a lot. So when I went to see him, before we went, I went to Sri Lanka, I asked David to write to him and ask him for 250 copies of the book. So I went to him and we talked for a little while and I said, Bhante, your book Concept and Reality, I want permission to print a thousand copies. And he said, no. And I was kind of shocked by that. He said, too many people are selling this book and it's supposed to be given away for free. And I said, that's what I do. And I want to give it away. But he still, he said, no. And then he said, there's this place on the, in the West, this Dhammasukha Meditation Center that asked for 250 copies of it. And I said, yeah, that was me. But I went and saw him the next year and he gave me permission because he saw that I was really honest about it. I wasn't trying to make money. But we have some of his books over on the table there. You can take a copy if you want. And you learn a lot. He has some real good ideas. Except when he starts getting close to talking about Nibbana, he switches over to the Visuddhimagga. And I don't understand that at all. But he was more of a scholar than he was a, uh, a practitioner. I doubt if he ever, ever did much serious meditation in his whole life. Uh, when he was, I think he was 25 years old, he was working on his doctorate and that was his thesis, concept and reality. And just as he was getting ready to uh, submit that, his teacher died. So the committee got together and they said, well, we already have two people that are writing on dependent origination and that sort of thing. So you have to write something else. So he did and he got his doctorate, but he carried that book around with him for 12 or 15 years. And he went to Island Hermitage where Nyanapanika, who was uh, a German scholar, and uh, he, it was a place for foreign monks to come. And he, uh, Nyanananda gave Nyanapanika the book and Nyanapanika was very impressed with it. And he went to Kandy and he, f he formed the Buddhist Publication Society. And that was the first book that he printed. And uh, we have since, I've, I've printed up a few times. And they, they are, you can have one. I don't charge for anything like that. I'm more interested that you get the Dhamma than whether I wrote it or somebody else wrote it. I don't care about that kind of stuff. Now, after I found out about what craving was and how, how to use it and, and went and did my meditation, when I came back, I wrote a book called the Anapanasati Sutta. And Somebody printed up a 3,000 copies for me, so I was giving it out. And uh, Keshri Damananda, he said, why don't you send that book to uh, Taiwan? There's a society there that likes to print up Dhamma books and send them all over the world. So I did. 
I sent them two copies and they wrote back and said, well, we just printed up 40,000 copies of your book because we really like it. And uh, they sent them all over the world. And now I can go into a library and look around and I'll, I'll find my book. I thought that was kind of neat. But when I came back to America, I heard that people were starting to print the copy of my, uh, copies of my book. I don't know what they did with them. Some, some went on Amazon and they were expensive books. They was $35 for, it, was, it wasn't even 100 pages. But I, I kept on, uh, just going around and teaching and that sort of thing and I went to Florida and I saw my book was there and as I reached for it the guy that that was taking care of it he said oh this book is great and I said thank you and he said why I said this is me and he said oh I thought you were dead <laughs> <laughs> but there's been a lot of copies that have been reprinted worldwide. They use it in universities for uh, religious studies. And now I've heard, I don't know how accurate any of this is, because I just go by what somebody else said, but there's about 750,000 copies that are worldwide. And I had some friends that were in India at a one monk monastery that had my book in the, in the, uh, their library. And that's the first time they'd ever run across an American author that wrote reasonably legibly how to do the meditation. And since then, they have become very, staunch followers of uh, the TWIM method. And the husband wrote a, his PhD thesis on this practice and the six R's. And you can have a copy of that somewhere. I, I don't know how many we have, but anyway, I wanted to read some more of the suttas to you. This sutta is called the Anathan Pendika Owada Sutta, Advice to Anathan Pendika. Anathan Pendika was the Buddha's major donor. He, he bought the piece of land at Sawati and he was a rich, uh, rich guy, basically. And he, he fed monks and he made sure that there was doctors that were coming and taking care of monks that were sick and, and they had enough robes and all, all of this kind of stuff. Anyway, 143. Thus have I heard on one occasion a Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pendika's Park. This is called Anathan Pendika's Park. And the forest around is Jetta's Grove. Now on that occasion, the householder Anathan Pendika was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He addressed a certain monk thus, Come, good man, go to the Blessed One, pay homage to him in my name with your head at his feet. And say, Venerable Sir, the householder Anathan Bendika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the feet of the Blessed One. Then go to Sariputta, pay homage to him in my name, with your head at his feet, and say, Venerable Sir, the householder Anathan Pendika is afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. He pays homage with his head at the feet of Venerable Sariputta. 
Then say, it would be good, venerable sir, if the venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder Anathampandika out of compassion. Yes, sir, the man replied. He went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and delivered his message. Then he went to the Venerable Sariputta after paying homage to him, sat, sat down and delivered his message saying, it would be good, venerable sir, if venerable Sariputta would come to the residence of the householder in Pandika out of compassion. The venerable Sariputta cons uh, consented in silence. Then the venerable Sariputta dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went to the residence of the householder in Pandika. Now, an interesting thing, the monks always went out with their, their robes and their bowl because if they would have left that in their room, somebody would have stolen it. That's really true. They didn't have locks like we have now. With the, the uh, Sariputta dressed, taking his bowl and outer robe, went to the residence of the householder in Athenpandika with Ananda as his attendant. Having gone there, he sat down on a seat made ready and said to the householder Ananda, or Anathanpandika, excuse me, I hope you're getting well, householder. I hope you are comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding, not increasing, and that you're, they're subsiding, not their increase is apparent. Polite thing to say, somebody's sick. Venerable sir, I'm not getting well. I'm not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. Just as if a strong man were splitting my head open with a sharp saw, a sharp sword. So too violent winds cut through my head. I'm not getting better. Just as a strong man were tightening a, a tough leather strap around my head as a headband. So too, there are violent pains in my head and I'm not getting better. Just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. So too, violent winds are carving up my belly. I'm not getting well. Just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals, so too violent burning is in my body. I'm not getting well. I'm not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding. Then, householder, you should train thus. Now, be very attentive with this. You're going to hear a lot of repetition. Don't let your mind wander. Let it sink in. I will not crave and cling to the eye, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. I will not crave and cling to the ear, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the ear. I will not crave and cling to the nose, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the nose. I will not crave and cling to the tongue, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the tongue. I will not crave and cling to the body, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the body. I will not crave and cling to mind, 
and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind. Thus, you should train. Householder, train thus. I will not crave and cling to forms, and my consciousness will not be dependent on forms. I will not crave and cling to sounds, and my consciousness will not be dependent on sounds. I will not crave and cling to odors, and my consciousness will not be dependent on odors. I will not crave and cling to flavors, and my consciousness will not be dependent on flavors. I will not crave and cling to tangibles, and my consciousness will not be dependent on tangibles. I will not crave and cling to mind objects, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind objects. Householder, you should train thus. I will not crave and cling to thy consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on eye consciousness. I will not crave and cling to ear consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the ear consciousness. I will not crave and cling to nose consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on nose consciousness. I will not crave and cling to tongue consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on tongue consciousness. I will not crave and cling to body consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on body consciousness. I will not crave and cling to mind consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind consciousness. Thus, you should train. I will not crave and cling to eye contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on uh, eye contact. I will not crave and cling to ear contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on ear contact. I will not crave and cling to nose contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on nose contact. I will not crave and cling to tongue contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on tongue contact. I will not crave and cling to body contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on body contact. I will not crave and cling to mind contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on mind contact. Householder, you should train thus. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of eye contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of eye contact. <clears throat> I will not crave and cling to feeling born of ear contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on ear, uh, feeling of ear contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of nose contact, and my consciousness will not will not be dependent on the feeling born of nose contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of tongue contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of tongue contact. I will not crave and cling to feeling born of body contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of body contact. I will not crave and, f and cling to feeling born of mind contact, and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling born of mind contact. That's what you need to train yourself. This is how you train yourself. You should train thus. I will not crave and cling to the earth element. And 
My consciousness will not be dependent on the earth element. I will not crave and cling to the water element. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the water element. I will not crave and cling to the fire element. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the fire element. I will not crave and cling to the air element and my consciousness will not be dependent on the air element. I will not crave and cling to the space element, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the space element. I will not crave and cling to the consciousness element, and my consciousness will not be dependent on conscious element. Thus you should train. I will not crave and cling to material form. And my consciousness will not be dependent on material form. I will not crave and cling to feeling. And my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling. I will not crave and cling to perception. And my consciousness will not be dependent on perception. I will not crave and cling to formations, and my consciousness will not be dependent on formations. I will not crave and cling to consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on consciousness. Thus, you should train. Householder, you should train thus. I will not crave and cling to the base of infinite space and my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of infinite space. I will not crave and cling to the base of infinite consciousness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of infinite consciousness. I will not crave and cling to the base of nothingness, and my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of nothingness. I will not crave and cling to the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Thus you should train. Now neither perception nor non-perception, if you've taken a bodhisattva vow, that's as far as you go. You don't get to attain Nibbana. Bodhisattva means future Buddha. And an awful lot of people, since they've come up with this concept of Bodhisattva, they might uh, have a lot of pride in being a Bodhisattva. I, I know a few of them that are really very, very strong in, in the Bodhisattva vow. But, in 40 or 50,000 lifetimes, they start to realize, you know, this is really a hard way to go. <laughs> it's really difficult, and they have to do it for more, four Mahakapas at least. There's three kinds of, of Samasambuddhas. There's an intelligent Samasambuddha, that's what Gotama was. There's the energetic uh, Sama Sam Buddha, and it takes eight Mahakapas to become one of these. And then there's the moral Sama Sam Buddha, and that takes 16 Mahakapas. That means universe uh, expansion and contraction. And that's, that's really a long, long, long time. So people that take the bodhisattva now, they, they have this idea, it's, it's kind of Vajrayana uh, Tibetan. Well, I'm going to stay and not become of, not get off the wheel until all beings will get off the wheel. The Buddha couldn't do it. If he could, we wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> He couldn't do it. So 
So why do these people have this idea, I'm going to stay around until all beings are enlightened? No, it's just not practical. <laughs> um, I had a question about what does it mean my consciousness won't be dependent on consciousness? When you get to the quiet mind, you'll get able to be able to see that. All of this stuff you'll be able to see. So patience. Keep progressing the way you have been and you'll, you'll see it before long. I have a lot of confidence in all of you. I really do. And I, I think it'll be, this will be a very interesting retreat. Okay, let's get back to the householder. You should train thus. I will not crave and cling to this world. And my consciousness will not be dependent on this world. I will not crave and cling to the world beyond. And my consciousness will not crave and cling on and be dependent on the world beyond. Householder, you should train thus. I will not crave and cling to what is seen. And my consciousness will not be dependent on what is seen. I will not crave and cling to what is heard. And my consciousness will not be dependent on what is heard. I will not crave and cling to what is sensed and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is sensed. I will not crave and cling to what is cognized, and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is cognized. I will not crave and cling to what is encountered, and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is encountered. I will not crave and cling to what is sought after, and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is sought after. I will not crave and cling to what is examined by mind. Western disease. Okay and my consciousness will not be dependent on what is examined by mind. When this was said, the householder and then Pindika wept and shed tears. Then the Venerable Ananda asked him, are you foundering, householder? Are you sinking? Now we're going to get into a place that I don't like the translation of this. You'll get to hear it in just a minute. I'm not foundering, Venerable Ananda, I'm not sinking. But although I have long waited upon the teacher and the monks, worthy of esteem, never before have I heard such a talk on the Dhamma. Now, Sariputta's answer to this, this is the one that I don't really get along with. Because the Buddha was an open-fisted, he didn't have any secrets. There's no secret teachings, right? But this implies that there was. Such talk on the Dhamma householder is not given to lay followers wearing white clothes. Such a talk on the Dhamma is given only to those who have gone forth, become monks. And I don't agree with that at all. Uh, I've, I've had some experiences where Thai, they, they say they have a secret, uh, a secret teaching. And there's a, other uh, cultures, they have their secret teaching. But I was at a conference, a Thai conference in uh, Florida, 
and I stood out like a, I, there was red-haired at the time, so I really stood tall and red-headed, and they're short and black-headed. So uh, I was talking with some monks, and my attendant at the time was a woman, Kema, and she was really, really, really into dependent origination. She understood it really well. So I was talking, there was 150 or 200 monks around, so I was talking to different ones and seeing what they knew and what they didn't know. And I looked over and I saw one of the major teachers in Thailand came as talking to him. And I thought, oh man, this, I, gotta, I gotta get over there and see what's happening. And as soon as I walked over, he put his back to Kema and he looked at me and he pointed at me like this. He said, why are you teaching the hidden teachers, the teachings of the Buddha? I didn't know I was. Why are you teaching these higher, higher aspects of, of the Dhamma? So I answered him. I said, because she can understand it. And he got mad and turned around and walked away. He didn't like that answer. There are some cultures in Asia that really push down women. And I have a tendency to teach them equally. I don't care. So I, I sometimes get in trouble with different cultures because I, I, when I went to Indonesia, I ordained women as seminary, and that was, uh, I became public en enemy number one with that, doing that. So, and every year afterwards I was, I was ordaining, they ordained for 10 days, I didn't see any harm in doing that, but it helped them spiritually, it helped them progress. So it was a good thing, but I became uh, an awful lot of monks were very unhappy with me because I did that. But the thing is, I traveled all over the country for a couple of years after I, I got back from Asia because I wanted to find out what this country was. I had no idea. I was 12 years in another cultures. So when I came back, I, I, I wanted to really know what was happening. And I started noticing when I was going to different monasteries that I was traveling with Sister Kema and she would sit off to the side and all these women came and talked to her about the Dhamma, but they wouldn't come to the monks. So I started thinking, well, we cut out half, half the population if we don't have some uh, bhikkhunis. So I've been a big advocate of that for a long time now. So uh, I teach the way the Buddha taught, open-handed, no sacred teachings. So you're getting straight from what the Buddha is talking about right here. And it's not my teaching. I don't have anything to do with it. I'm just reading you what the Buddha said. So, well then, sorry, Venerable Sariputta, let such a talk on the Dhamma be given to lay people in white clothes. There are clansmen with little dust in their eyes who are wasting away through not hearing such a talk on the Dhamma. 
that will be for those who will understand that Dhamma. Then after giving a householder and giving the householder Anathan Pintika this advice, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Ananda rose from their seats and departed. Soon after they had left, the Venerable Anathan Pandika died, and he reappeared in the Tusita heaven. That's the heavenly realm where the next Buddha is going to be, Maitreya. It's gonna, it'll happen, he'll come, but it's gonna be a long time before that, that occurs. A lot of changes have to happen. Then when it was night, a well, it was well advanced, Anathan Pika, now a young god of beautiful appearance, went to the Blessed One, illuminating the whole of Jetta's grove. After paying homage to the Blessed One, he stood at one side and addressed the Blessed One in stanza. Oh, blessed is this Jetta's grove, dwelt in by sagely Sangha, wherein resides the king of Dhamma, the fount of all my happiness. By action, knowledge, and Dhamma, by virtue and noble way of life, by these are morals purified, not by lineage or wealth. Therefore, a wise person who sees what truly leads to his own good should investigate the Dhamma and purify himself with it. Sariputta has reached the peak in virtue, peace, and wisdom's ways. Any monk who has gone, has gone beyond at least can only equal him. This is what the blessed, the, the young god Anathan Pindika said. The teacher approved. Then the young god Anathan Pindika, thinking, the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to the blessed one, keeping him on his right. He vanished at once. When the night was ended, the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. Monks, last night, when the night was well advanced, there came to me a certain young, beautiful God in, in appearance who illuminated the whole of Jetta's grove. After paying homage to me, he sat down at one side and dressed me uh, in stanza that I just read. That is what the young God said. Then the young God, thinking the teacher has approved of me, paid homage to me, and keeping me on his right, vanished at once. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Surely, Venerable Sir, that young God must have been Anathan Pandika. For the householder Anathan Pandika had perfect confidence in the venerable Sariputta. Good, good Ananda, as far as reasoning goes, you have drawn the right conclusion. That young God was Anathan Pandika, no one else. That's what the Blessed One said. The venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now this particular sutta is something that I read to people if they're on their deathbed. And it helps them to let go of things and keeps their mind attentive. Even if they are in a coma, they still hear it. They just haven't got enough energy to interact. And that's why I've told some doctors that they go into the, somebody that has a coma and they start talking about how bad they're doing and all this stuff. I tell them, they have to leave. Go away. These people can hear what you're saying. And it, it takes hope away from them. So 
I have, uh, over the years, I've practiced uh, going to hospitals often and being with them as they die, mostly because I wanted to be around people as they were dying to see if people had the, the visions that the Buddha said that you have before you die or you can have before you die. Uh, if you haven't led a reasonably good life, you can have visions of hell realms and really nasty different things. If you were not all evil, somebody like Hitler, then uh, you can be reborn as an Asura. And Asuras are mainly black kind of ghosts. I don't know if you saw the movie, uh, oh, what was it? Oh, I can't think of it. It was where this guy died. He was an evil guy and he had black ghosts comes up and pulls him away and takes him to one of the hell realms. Anyway, uh, there are some people that will have visions of animals and they'll be reborn as an animal. So be careful what you wish for. There are some people that when they, right before they die, they have visions of family members that have died before them. And they'll start talking to them. And somebody will say, well, who are you talking to? And say, these, these family members, they're right here talking with me. And that's when people that aren't very aware of how this process works will say, oh, you're crazy. There's something wrong with you. You've lost your mind. But when I was with people, I, I spent about a year at a nursing home where there was somebody that died about once a week. So I got a chance to be with them. My mother ran the nursing home, so I pretty much did what I want. And when they were getting close to death, then I would spend all, all my time with them. And I was, I was reading uh, the Bible and things like that to them, where I found out something very interesting. The precepts are in the Bible. Not advertised very well, but they're in the Bible. So what I did was I would read that to them and tell them this is part of Matthew and I gave them the numbers and all of that. And they would listen to that and their mind would be uplifted, their mind would be pure. So there's different kinds of mental states that people can go through right before they die. And I tried to be with them to guide them so that they had a, a happy existence. And it was real interesting. And the last thing I did, quite often, family members would come and be with them as they died. And they didn't know me from anybody because I was long red hair and beard and walking around in shorts. And they thought, oh, who is this stranger? So I would leave. But before I left, I would say to that person, even when they were in a coma, I remember the times when you did something that made you happy and you helped other people. And then I said, every, every good act that I have ever done in whatever lifetime, I share that merit with you. And they would acknowledge that in one way or another, mind to mind, or sometimes I, I walk out of the room and it's like somebody tapped me on the shoulder and I turn around and there's nobody there. Now, this is real. This is, this is my actual experience. And I had a lot of joy, so I, I suspected that they died at that time and they were saying thank you to me. 
But it's real interesting being with people when they're getting close to death because it's not time to be joking around and messing around. It's time to get down to it. Now, a lot of you, I have you doing forgiveness. If there was a couple of weeks before they died, I would go to them and tell them that they had to do forgiveness and talk to the people they needed to forgive. Uh, family members that had wronged them in one way or another or caused them some kind of suffering. And they would always die with an uplifted mind when they did that because they weren't holding on to this old pain and and be distracted with the hindrances of the memories of those things. Now, it's a real interesting phenomenon, and I got this from uh, Stephen Levine. There's, there's books over here, of, of it's, one of them is called Who Dies? And he was with a lot of people that were dying. He was one of the, the original explorers of that. And one of the things that he wrote about was when somebody's in a coma, if you want to communicate with them, you put your hand on their, uh, their forehead or on their heart and you start synchronizing your breathing with them. When they breathe in, you breathe in. When they breathe out, you breathe out. After a couple of minutes of doing that, then you mentally ask them, is there anything I can do for you? Well, sometimes they want to see a relative or something. Okay, then go find the relative and bring them. Sometimes it's just as simple as I, I need some water. It can be any, any kind of thing. But there is mind-to-mind -mind communication that way. And there's always a lot of relief because they're, they don't feel like they're alone. Now they feel much more at ease. And I would spend time with the families if they were there and teach them how to do loving kindness. Because every, everybody feels helpless if somebody dies. Somebody's close to you. Oh, I feel so bad, I don't know what to do. And you get real sad. Well, you don't have to be helpless. You can radiate loving kindness to that person and radiate loving kindness to the family members because they're all suffering and radiate loving kindness to the doctors because most doctors are very much afraid of death and radiate loving kindness to the nurses and the janitors and everybody that has any, anything and you keep your mind focused on that, you don't have time to be sad. Right? You radiate that loving kindness as much as you possibly can. Now, when my mother died a few years back, uh, there was a lot of family members that came on the day that she died. And they were all sitting around being sad, not talking much. And I thought, I'm not going to do this. So I started radiating equanimity so they would have an accepting mind. Now, these are all born-again Christians. My family is real big on that. And they think that I'm really strange because I don't go along with it. But the equanimity, they could feel that. And when my mother died, she died very peacefully. And after she died, 
they were still sitting around and after 10 minutes or so, one of my family members said, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. And I said, no, it doesn't matter. Mom's not around anymore. She's gone to another realm. And you're not going to affect her one way or the other if you laugh or if you cry. So some of them cried. Some of them were just sitting there feeling more and more equanimous. And when they got ready to leave, all of them came up to me one at a time and thanked me for being there. They felt what I was doing and they knew it was a good thing. So it depends on what you feel like doing. If you want to radiate equanimity to beings, do that. I did it because I wanted that balance. So there wasn't outreaches, uh, crying and wailing and that sort of thing. It was all in a balanced, calm way. But loving kindness takes care of that too. It has equanimity in it, but just not as strong. So it's an interesting thing. There's no part in your life where you ever have to feel hopeless or helpless. What do you think the six R's are for? Right? You can carry them with you. Too many people have this idea that sitting is only being in meditation while you're quiet. But no, I'm, I'm showing you that it's meditation all the time. You see that you have a hindrance coming up, something you don't like coming up, six R it, let it be, it's not that big a deal. You're training yourself right now to, to be able to do that in your daily life. And it's real important that you understand this aspect of it. Oh, I've had some students that have practiced with me for many, many, many years. And they would come and they would do a retreat and they would take the, the precepts while they were doing the retreat. And then when they got off retreat, <coughs> they would say, now I can go back to being the way I was. Like that was something good. and a lot of cursing. And that's breaking a precept. Anytime you curse, what's in your mind most of the time when you curse? Is it loving kindness? <laughs> no, it's hatred, dissatisfaction, dislike. So I've been talking for a long time. Do you have any other Questions. Actually, I have one question. Okay. The hospice, when you were working with your mom. Yeah. That was before you were a monk. No, that's as I was a monk. Well, you, oh, were well, you had red hair. What, oh, you you mean, yeah, that was before was I became a monk. So I wasn't at the hospice. I, I helped start the hospice, but it was at the nursing home. At the nursing home. Yeah. 80s, right before, like 83, 84, 85, or maybe 80, 81, after San It was before I went to San Francisco and was with East Usi Lananda. Oh, before that, okay. So it might have been 79 or early 80, part of 79 and into 80. been doing this stuff.